Uh, so we're going to start with the first topic, which is uh, sort of about the formation of a string quartet and um, sort of the practicalities of playing with a string quartet. Um, so maybe you'd like to tell us about how the Sigmund Quartet was formed in the first place. So I'll, n neither of us were there at its inception. Um, Thomas and Annette started playing together when they were at school. I think Annette was about 12 and Thomas was a little older. And they decided that they wanted to play chamber music together. And their parents both uh, had doctor parents who were also passionate amateur musicians and played, I think, in a quartet together, their parents, funnily enough. So that's another way that they got together. And they've just kept the quartet going uh, through various formations. Um, and that's, that's how that happened. They, they were actually quite serious from pretty near the beginning. So they were taking lessons with the Melos Quartet, which was sort of one of the top German quartets at the time. They would travel from Hagen, which is sort of near, mm, it's in the, in the Ruhrgebiet, down to Stuttgart, which is quite a, a way to have lessons with the Melos Quartet when I think they were still at school or in early university. So they, they were really going for it seriously. So they, they knew they wanted to be a professional quartet from the very they, early they, they knew that they wanted to play chamber music together at the highest level and then see where it went. There was yeah. a period when Thomas was a um, member of a um, symphony orchestra uh, in Essen. And then he decided that he will quit because he didn't think this is what he actually would love to do. And of course, people were kind of very doubtful about it, like, you leave this really very good job, but he decided to do that. And so, I mean, they have been playing for a long time. You joined when? I joined end of 2007. Yeah. yeah. So and it's been already. Yeah. And they studied with, you know, Alban Berg and all the, all the big uh, names kind of really yeah. taking it seriously. And so you joined in 2007 and you in 2016. Yes. And how did you join the quartet? How did that come to happen? Well, I was an online find. Um, I had just left uh, my quartet in South Africa. We disbanded and I wanted to spend some time in Europe, at least studying, maybe even moving here. I wasn't sure at that point yet. And I knew that I'd, I, at that point, I, I was not really interested in playing quartet anymore. I actually wanted to study conducting. Um, and I came to London to a very good friend of mine, composer Robert Fockins. And a few weeks in, we met up with a, a friend of his, an um, Israeli violinist. And uh, she was living between London and Düsseldorf. And she told me of this uh, string quartet in Cologne, who was having difficulties finding a viola plan. I was like, oh God, no, I, I can't deal with another quartet. I've just had <laughs> five years of this and I, I, I'm done. And that night I came home and I opened my laptop and there was an email from a friend in New York who was forwarding uh, sort of a, um, an email that had been doing, around, doing the rounds concerning the same quartet. So it was like, Okay, maybe, maybe I should write them. Maybe, not that I'm into omens or anything like that, but that, you know, like from both sides of the Atlantic on one evening, maybe I should just send them an email. And then I disappeared in the spam, in the spam account of the, the first violinist for a while. And then later in that year, I then eventually had a chance to go and play with them. I was kind of one of the last. And I found out later, I think, if, if I had not been it, they had been considering disbanding the quartet. So I'm glad that I managed to make a, a good enough impression. And then they asked me to stay, and I was like, shit, I don't really want to move to London uh, and freelance there. And here I can work with some wonderful musicians in the quartet and study with some of the best musicians in Europe. And um, so that's how I then decided to stay. Yeah. yeah, and with me it was just that the first violinist, she got pregnant, and then they had a year where they were giving her extra time to find out, um, you know, if she wants to continue or not. 
but she must have been thinking already before that maybe it's too much for her. Um, she, I think she felt a lot of pressure and um, just wanted to get out of it somehow. She just felt this is the right time and the right reason to go. And then they had the difficult task because they were so somehow um, uh, you know, so generous to her not to say, okay, you don't, either you play or not, but they gave her a whole season, right? You gave a whole season to make up her mind, and this was a very full season, totally crazy. So you played with eight different yeah, we had first like violins. More than 50 concerts with all sorts of different programs. And whenever I came back, yeah. they had to change the Boeings again. <laughs> it was, yes. uh, did yes. we play this with this guy? No, we played it with <laughs> her. And so, yeah. <laughs> And um, so then we had a nice tour, and I also didn't want to play quartets, actually, no. uh, because <laughs> I have to say that very often the uh, professional string quartets um, turned me a little bit off in the sense of the utter perfection and at the same time dullness in the sense that things are prepared and then delivered as prepared, and there's no... Um, actual music making in the moment. That's how I conceived it. But I was, of course, also biased. I, and also, I didn't know the scene. But this was, I, I was always scared a little bit about this perfection and that cage. So mm, I didn't know. But then we had a great tour. And um, uh, yes. And then I said yes. And then they got scared and thought, really, do we want him? Um, yeah, there was, a, there was a moment of silence, like, hmm, okay, he said yes. And then in the end we got together and then we took some time to, you know, to settle down. And uh, I think now we have really a nice working uh, and friendship. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very, uh, we collaborative and we all work for the project, so to say. And how did you both know that you wanted to pursue chamber music? Was it something that you always knew from like a young age, like our age? Did you know that you wanted to play in a string quartet? Or no, I just wanted sort of to happen? be a really good musician and okay. make stuff, do stuff that I like. That was always my first goal is that I want to do good music and I never want to feel like I do stuff that doesn't make me happy and fulfilled. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so you both joined uh, this quartet, the Sigmund Quartet, after it was made. Yes. So the, the name was out there already. Yes. But you, you made Santango, Santanga Quartet, if I'm saying yes. that correctly. Yes. How did you, when, when you decided to make that quartet, how did you know that, how did you get your name out there? How did you start getting concerts and stuff? Well, we, we were very lucky. It was a very sort of unusual and unique moment in South African music history. And as much as... Um, there was a production, um, William Kentridge is one of South Africa's best known visual artists and also uh, theatre directors and opera directors and uh, a, a genius guy. And he had a production called The Confessions of Zeno, which he was doing with Kevin Volans and um, a couple of, a Handspring Puppet Company. Also, I don't know if they've done anything in Ireland, I'm not sure, but they are, they are world renowned anyway. And the Duke Quartet had been playing, and then there was a problem, and they couldn't do the next run. So um, the production decided that they wanted to see if they could find a young South African quartet who could take over. And I was just finishing university at that point, um, and I got a call from one of my lecturers saying, this is happening, do you have a quartet? And I was like, of course I have a quartet. I mean, we didn't have a quartet. <laughs> um, of course we'll have, we have a quartet, we'll put a quartet together. And we, we rehearsed like crazy for a month and a half and did a, a demo CD for Kevin. And we got an invitation to go to Johannesburg to, to play for them. And after some deliberation, um, Kevin was kind enough to say, okay, they can, they can join. I mean, we were, three of us were in our early 20s and our cellist was uh, about 10 years older. He was more experienced, but as a quartet, we were very young. And so Kevin was sort of our quartet daddy at that point. I mean, he is incredibly uh, experienced working with Kronos Quartet, U Quartet. I mean, any number of very good quartets and had a lot of knowledge to impart to us younglings. 
So that, that was a, a great experience. And as a result of that, we ended up having access to some of the, the, the new music uh, festivals and just generally arts festivals in South Africa. And um, our first violinist then, Mark Ace, uh, had an incredibly entrepreneurial business sense and just took it and ran with it. And so in the five years that we played together, we were actually able to be quite successful in as I, as successful, I think, as we could be in in that scene, uh, and even opening up some some doors that would not necessarily have been opened by other quartets. But that had a lot to do with the fact that we had sort of an ongoing relationship with Kevin and with William. We did a whole lot of his films live, and we're touring all the time with that. So, sort of a, a slightly unusual way to go for a quartet, but it, it, was, it was a great ride, it really was. Mm -hmm. And so that happened in your early to mid-twenties, just after you left university, I think you said, is it? Exactly. That yeah, okay, nice. so that's yeah. at a stage that a lot of us are at yes. now. Is there yeah. any advice that you might give people at that age now who would like to do something similar, like setting up a professional quartet? Just going for it. Yeah. And um, not thinking too far ahead, I would say. I would always think that's also my experience a little later on when I was getting a little bit more courageous um, to pursue the projects you want to do and if you think you don't have the means to do it, to do them anyway. You know, um, and uh, in, in the end, of course, um, we always have to ask ourselves the question, will we be, um, you know, who is paying the rent? Um, but I think if you endeavor in this kind of um, in this business is you if you think I want to be a musician you do it anyway because you want to and I think it can be sustained the best if you follow your wishes and just go for it there will always be a way to you know to get by and just you know organize stuff uh, play for people connect with people I think the more one is social, socially, socially, oh, can you help me? Uh, what's, the social, next, what's the next word? <laughs> um, social competent. Oh, socially competent, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, if you, then I think you, you will have difficulties yeah. if, if not, because it's all about connecting people and, and, not, and then not even expecting something in return immediately. Because very often we think, okay, there's this guy and it's really important and I have to talk to this person so that something happens for me. But I think that's not the way it works. You just meet. Yeah. That's it. And then you meet again. And then things go completely different than from what you expected. And then suddenly you end up there. What? I didn't plan that, but actually it's right. I mean, there is, if, if one has an entrepreneurial bent, it can be useful. If one doesn't, it can also be useful to know somebody who does. <laughs> and sort of get them on board. I mean, different people have different qualities, and I think if one knows or, or becomes aware of what one's qualities are, then then one can get sort of divisions of labor. Um, well, sort. Of, I mean, in our quartet, we have you know, I I do a lot of the website and I do a lot of the programming and. Um, uh, yeah, we, we various, various project yeah. developments, and we, we each have our own project. And Annette, for instance, takes care of a lot of the financial crap, which we are so thankful that <laughs> she does and she hates, but she's, yeah. she is absolutely invaluable. And then she also has the pro other projects that she, she takes care of. And, and so, you know, dealing with agencies and whatever, it's sort of divvied out. Um, but like one, thing, one thing will always stay the same, and it is on nearly every level. I don't know any artists who doesn't have this kind of feeling. You always think you should be a step further than you are. And I think one has to be extremely um, aware of the fact and somehow embrace it. You know, we are not where we want to go. This is actually a good thing because that makes us, you know, want uh, to explore more. But we, it, we shouldn't get frustrated. And that took me a long time to understand that um, actually, I'm on it all the time. I'm actually, for me, being uh, over 50 now, it's kind of um, on the road, and I only realized 
couple of years ago, I always thought, oh, there is a future. And then I uh, realized, oh, you're right in it. Uh, and it's fine. You want more, but what you have is fantastic. Yeah. So we, and, and, every, and on each level, even the famous people, you know, where you think, oh, God, so successful. And then you talk to them and they say, yeah, you know, and then, you know, there was this guy and I, I wanted to be asked for this because, you know, somebody had to drop out and they didn't ask me. And, you know, my agent really doesn't work for me. And I don't really. And, and you think, what? So <laughs> yeah. this, uh, um, the, 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 this feeling, it, I think it's good to, to kind of to realize that um, this is the normal situation as a musician. We will never be where we are. It always will be financially difficult. Um, but the, on the other hand, we do the best, wonder, most wonderful thing in the world. So. Okay, maybe you'd like to move on. Yeah, I'm quite curious as to how rehearsals work for you. Like we've seen over this weekend, like how differing your opinions are um, when it comes to music. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you find that that's a benefit having having those contrasts and opinion, like when it comes to playing as a group? Definitely, I think. Um, well, I think so. <laughs> yes, I, we do agree occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually we agree a lot when it comes to what the result should be. Yeah. yeah. So I think what you have experienced is our very different styles of teaching. So our rehearsal, um, it's that way of rehearsing starts on a different level. And um, we have also there, we have totally different approaches, but yet we have... Um, like many th things have established itself as a, you know, something you don't have to talk about anymore. And that took a while, for instance, when I came into the quartet until we found this balance. But now when we sit down, we just rehearse. And then actually rarely do we totally, I don't, do we disagree on something? Like, yeah. Yeah, do we? Okay. <laughs> like what, for instance? Da, 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 da. In the rainy, rainy. Oh yeah. There are there are a couple of things, but I mean, it, it's like an old married couple who is like, "Can you put the toilet seat down?" I put the toilet seat down. You know, it's sort of on 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 that level sometimes. But for the most part, there there is a, a very very broad consensus musically and and. Um, <laughs> when, when you do have those situations of, you know, like you really are like kind of head to head, how does that get resolved or like how do you? So this is actually now that you talk about it, this is maybe one of the very few places we haven't <laughs> solved yet. No, it's true. We recorded but, in March, but we, will, <laughs> we have a few months. But we will record that next year and I'm really, yeah. really looking forward to that and then hear it in the boot and then find yeah. out. But in general, you, okay, there are occasional moments when one is so passionate about your opinion, you know, your own, and you think, and then you go for it. And I think we know how this works psychologically. So if you feel that one of the group is kind of really has a mission, uh, then you are wise to just, you know, follow that mission and let it be and go with it. And there is always something to it. I think there's no reason in doing that. Um, there's always a plus. Um, it's a totally um, kind of... Uh, uh, I have this one thing I learned from a guy, Matthew Barley. Do, do you know Matthew Barley? He's a cellist from London. He's the husband of Victoria Mulova. And he did a workshop with our orchestra. And I don't remember much of it. We did rhythm stuff. And I only rem but it was very good. But the one thing I remember, it's a very short phrase. It is, yes, and, and not, no, but. So, um, and that helps a lot. You sit there, and somebody suggests something, and your first reaction sometimes is like, what? No, please not. I hate this. And then if in that moment you go the other way and say, okay, I will try it. And also this new suggestion doesn't mean that what I've been doing or thinking before is, you know, is eradicated, but it's a new idea. And if I will follow it, I will not like it in the moment. And sometimes we don't agree on something, but then we have those two things. We have said it and then we know 
let's play for a while, let's leave it, and something will come out of it. And as it's a, a long journey, maybe some things have not been solved, but we can live with it and live with it, and it will come. So you need to be. Um, what 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 we were talking about this afternoon with the trio was um, whatever happens and what I mean. Sometimes one. It, everybody has a chance to have a shit day and if one is unlucky they collide and then there can be uh, sparks that fly but one knows and one understands that one is coming from a place of very deep respect for each other as, as musicians but m even more so as human beings and I think if that respect is in place then, then, then it is easier to sort of deal with the occasional bad mood. I mean, invariably, because I live in Tallinn at the moment in Estonia, so when I come for rehearsals, it means that I've already had like a 12-hour day before I arrive. I mean, I get up at 3.30 in the morning in Tallinn, take a five o'clock flight to be at Berlin or Hamburg, and then take a train to Bremen, and then I have lunch. And then we have a six hour rehearsal. And towards the end of that, sometimes I am a little frazzled. And usually my colleagues are kind enough to, um, <laughs> to sort of just let that pass. Um, but yeah. that, I mean, that is something I think that goes for every human contact. It's all about respect. No matter who you are and what you do, you just need to respect your. The, the people you interact with, and then life is much more friendly and makes much more sense. Yeah. Also, your students you need to respect, right? As a teacher, you need to respect your students, and the students should be aware that they deserve respect, yeah. and they should act accordingly, and also draw lines if they feel treated unrespectfully. But I think these, this is now much more uh, um, you know, common understanding but um, not always, yeah. I think. Yeah. Music teaching is stuck a little bit uh, behind on some levels, I think, in some places anyway. Nice to see the changes starting to come there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Move on? Uh, so on the topic of rehearsals, um, as you say, you could travel very far and for very long to get to this rehearsal. And you know sometimes people's schedules are really busy. You could have a really long day and you get to your sometimes six hour rehearsal and you want to make the most of those six hours because you've devoted these six hours to the rehearsal. Yeah. How would you advise making the most of the rehearsal and making every minute count? I don't know. At this point, I'm too tired. Do you want to take <laughs> <laughs> I have a 12 hour journey behind me. You, <laughs> you feel this word. <laughs> I, think, um, I think you have to react to the situation. So if you notice that nothing comes out of what you're doing right now, you just have to switch, do something else, maybe play something that doesn't require so much uh, attention or do something slow or have a coffee. And then also give in, you know, if it is not fruitful, you might as well have a break so that you are fresh the next day. Mm. Short breaks can be very useful. I think sometimes when one forgets the power of a five or ten minute break, how, how useful that can be. I personally think it's nice to have a clear structure. Sometimes I find it a little bit difficult when we have a whole day and we don't have a structure and then you go on rehearsing and rehearsing and I feel it's, I don't know, I lose my, my, my I don't have control of my forces anymore. And you know. I mean, before before Florian joined, um, we were all based around Cologne, Düsseldorf area, and at that point, it was a lot easier. We would have our sort of work week, as it were, and occasionally one would have other projects or teaching, or one would sort of schedule around that. But one would have a four to five hour rehearsal in the afternoon and then the morning was there for practicing or teaching or whatever uh, needed to happen and one would meet and one would have that sort of time and then that would be it. It was uh, more like a job um, and that certainly has some advantages. Uh, now it's just not possible to rehearse like that but even so one sort of does look 
And I mean, usually we have a lot of repertoire to cover. We are a kind of quartet that does a lot of new stuff and then does crazy projects like we're doing in Holland next week where we do a cycle of the Haydn Opus 20 quartets plus a whole lot of our favorite uh, stuff. Um, and it's just a monster program. So and it's just like, ah, yeah, got to get through yeah, it somehow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so but that that also tends to focus things a little bit. So that's sometimes my problem as a first violin because I have to play so many notes that in these um, situations sometimes I feel I don't have enough time to practice, but that has to do that before I didn't have enough time to practice because I did another project. It's very difficult to plan well. So I'll practice tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and then within the rehearsals, I know when I've played in quartets and other groups, sometimes there's differing opinions as to which uh, instrument line is more important at any given point. There could be maybe a feud between the viola and the second violin. No, my line is more important. No, mine is more important. I should bring mine out. How would you settle such a dis dispute? How would you decide as a group which one to, um, to lead with? I think it's a very good sign that we don't have these discussions very often. Not very, very rarely. often. You yeah. would sometimes, would, one of us would say, you know, I think this is the main voice and I'm struggling to get through. Or, you know, sometimes I play something and I don't know the piece so well because I know less than the rest of my colleagues. And then somebody points out that actually I think I'm really important, but I'm not. And oops, ah, okay. Um, but I think there should not be uh, fights. I know quartets, I, I know p personal acquaintances where, for instance, one instrumentalist always feels like, oh, I can't be heard. Um, and that's a pity. It uh, drains a lot of uh, energy. I think uh, we should always kind of be in consent about the music. And then it's clear, you know, who's, yeah. who's leading. I mean, I mean there, are, there are some situations where, I mean, put it this way, I think some of the time when there are questions like this, maybe it is just through a, the, maybe the the knowledge of the the score as a totality could be more and when one looks at it more deeply like that then questions like that sometimes resolve themselves um but then one can also just try things out i think that's important being open as we were saying with the other question uh being open to trying things out and see what works better and sometimes it what works better for the piece and sometimes it what sometimes it's what works better for the quartet and sometimes and you only will find out after the few performances yeah like death and the maiden yeah uh, i have these variations when i play all these funny yeah. notes there and um i remember that it was an issue for me to find the r real balance because it's very acrobatic and somehow you don't want to be on tiptoes all the time and I, now I don't feel this is an issue anymore. I don't know what happened, but we just found it. So we give it time, I would say. And maybe a bit about democracy within a quartet. Um, when you're rehearsing, is there someone whose opinion kind of trumps other people's opinions? Or do you think everyone's opinion is equally important and you come to a decision as a group? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. When, it, when it's not no. my opinion, then it, it's as group. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. But there are different groups. Like if you if you play with the Aditi Quartet, you do what Aditi says, um, and uh, that's then their DNA. Uh, but ours is uh, actually that we, as as you know, we respect each other and we take every opinion in. And sometimes somebody is very has a lot of power in the moment, and then will maybe drive a little bit more than the other one, but I don't... I think it also has to do with the fact that um, because we tend to be more sort of searching and spontaneous in our performances, the kind of decisions that we make in rehearsals are sort of less long-term and this is how it's going to be for the next three seasons because we've rehearsed it and we've decided it and that's the law. So, so those kind of discussions just have a, a different kind of um, uh, importance. It's just about the understanding of the piece. We want to understand more and more and more. And the more, more we know about the piece, the better yeah. we will play it. And I'm, I'm sure everybody who's worked with me this week 
cannot hear the word flow for fear of vomiting. Um, but once one sort of gets into a state where one can sort of follow that flow over uh, an entire movement, um, one sees that out of that certain, certain questions are posed afresh and other, other questions cease to be important because in that moment that's how it has to be and that, that is a sort of a beautiful understanding that one can get to with a quartet that plays together for so long is to sort of go on that kind of journey together and, and one person nudges you in that direction and then the other person nudges you in that direction and one nudges a little bit but one is in the same stream. Um, so yeah, those are... Great. I'd love to know how, how that changes um, when you're working with a composer, you were talking about playing new music, um, especially with kind of debuting new pieces. Um, it, would you usually invite the composer in to the rehearsals? Absolutely, what, whatever yeah. opportunity there is, not just out of respect, but because one can learn so much and get so many new impulses, not only for the piece, which is important, but also an insight into their understanding of, of their own music and, and music in general. And one can learn so many things from, from, from composers who, I mean, we don't write music, um, certainly not full time. Um, so to, to be able to interact with somebody who does is always fascinating. Sometimes, you know, if you have a first performance and you arrive at the location and maybe you have two days, then you have to decide, like you say, okay, maybe we get the composer, you know, first rehearsal and then we have one for ourselves so that you uh, also can work on it because some people might be a little bit more complicated or talk and maybe you think you also need to work on your own. So you need to, we always get asked by the, I mean, we just, we, we do schedules and then we would say, come here and go then and then. Yeah. Yeah. In an ideal situation, uh, um, I think close to ideal was when we were learning Kevin's 12th quartet actually. Kevin Varnes' quartet, he came to us in Cologne, I think it was two months or so before the premiere, and we had a weekend, I mean, it's a big 40-minute work, and Kevin is quite collaborative in as much as he's, he's happy to sort of take, take suggestions and one might rescore certain chords and things like that. So that also takes maybe a little more time than a composer who just says, this is what I've written, this is how it is. Um, but then one has the time to really put it together and, as you say, to find it for oneself before one then has the, the premiere. Yeah. And when you're working with a composer, would you always kind of refer back to the composer with questions, maybe like when you were considering different phrasings or different way to play sections? Um, how much would you just completely go back to the composer and how much would you kind of take it as artistic license of, you know, it's your performance. Where do you kind of... I think um, when you feel as a player that, you know, after you had contact with a composer, when you feel you know what's it about, then I think I would come back with questions when I find things unclear in the score. Like, I don't get this. Is this really that, the note? Um, yeah. But then I, I'm, you always, you can only play when you feel like you, have a language in which you perform the piece. So if you have questions concerning the language you are sp you're speaking, then you should refer to the composer. But at a certain point, you know what you are doing, and then you just have it, occasional questions. Yeah, it, it also depends on the composer's attitude. I think um, some composers can be incredibly pedantic about what they write and only accept a fairly, fairly narrow reading of the score, and some composers are very happy to to see what one brings to the score and what they might not have um, anticipated themselves. There's that lovely story of Brahms 
walking through maybe the Musikverein, wherever it was, um, during a rehearsal of Arthur Nikisch conducting, I think, the Second Symphony, let's say. And Nikisch was famous for being a magician and sort of making things happen. And Brahms was sort of wandering around, muttering to himself, is that my symphony? It, is, is that what I meant? But it has to be that way. So, I mean, it, a lot comes out of the moment and yeah, that's. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about your core tweet project. Uh, we're starting to run out of time, so we'll keep it brief. But uh, yeah. I came across this project online. It's a fantastic uh, idea for a project. I'll let you guys know just in case you don't know what it is. Uh, so it's, it's this idea of uh, leaving it up to composers and letting them know that there's a project going where you can create a piece of 140 notes, similar it's to... It's 280 now. Sorry, it's, it's 280 80. because okay. Twitter upped. <laughs> okay, so you've upped it to 280, uh -huh. so <laughs> we've upped it to, to, to 280 as well. Similar yes. to a tweet, which is a fantastic idea, and I'm sure you got loads of entries for it. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that project and what it was like making it? Okay, uh, the, the super, super duper quick tweet version. Um, so the idea was born about six years ago out of a desire to have some kind of a, um, a kind of a sampler of as many possible voices and styles um, that are being written in nowadays um, and what form something like that might take. And I was just joining Twitter at that point and it really was one of those bizarre moments after uh, Weihnachtsmarkt in Regensburg after some Glühwein um, that the word just popped into my head and then I spent the next few months sort of fleshing it out and developing it and then I took it to the quartet and then then we sort of after about six months launched it and in that time I was just um, praying that nobody thought of that name because at, at that point it was really that it, it was nobody had come up with that idea yet. So, and maybe just to to uh, you were looking at Weber. Exactly. So I looked at 140 notes at that point, and because it's a kind of an arbitrary uh, figure, once I decided what I wanted to define as a note. So in this case, I define a note as a sounding pitch. So if it's notated with a, a, a tie or something like that, whatever the sounding pitch is, that's, that's what we consider to be a note or character in this case. And each of the Weber six bagatelles, which uh, is one of the masterpieces of 20th century music, not just quartet literature, just of, of all music, each of those clocked in at under 140. So it's like, okay, it's possible to create something of a very high quality, even with this limitation. So let's see who we can interest. And um, we've been incredibly lucky to, to have some magnificent composers and the of idea, all ages. And the idea is we use it, so we use it to get to know composers. We ask yeah. also famous composers to write for us, but we do workshops. Like now in Holland, we go to the academy in Den Haag. We have composition students writing for us. We meet with them, we play their piece. This is one thing. This is great, you know, it's a great um, opportunity. You have to confine yourself to this, uh, to this limit. So, yeah, but it's kind of very demanding. And uh, the other thing is we go to, uh, we have students, uh, like a school, school kids. Scholars, yeah. Yeah, if you have a, if you have a good, um, wie sagt man da, a Pädagoge. Um, Pädagog. Yeah, you know, um, who knows how to work with kids, um, then they write for us. And our next step is we want to create an app that is not just a cheap app, but an app that works with harmonies. Allows us to, yeah, allows, allows, we're not exactly sure what kind of form it's going to take yet, but that, that we will be able to help kids create uh, a quick core tweet that we can then play yeah. for them so that there is the one side is the, the composition process and by its very nature it'll have to be in a workshop situation something that that can go a little bit quickly but then the next step is bringing it off the page 
into reality and seeing how it is to interact and how it is to have one's own piece performed and that can be very empowering. And transforming. Seen, yes, how, how kids of eight, nine, ten years old experience that and it's tremendous. So that's, that's sort of another aspect of the, the, court, the project. Uh, a lot of those pieces are on their YouTube channel if you'd like to listen to them later. Um, I think I'll open, open it up to the well, audience. Well, Jonathan's is as well, yes. Uh, Jonathan's yes. is as yes. well, yes. Yes. Yeah, great piece. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, uh, fire away. I was very interested in Florian's point about how like, there's this element of maybe some quartets are totally focused on perfection and that's the way you do it. And I suppose my question would be, and then this is to both of you, in your playing, if that's not what you're trying to achieve when you perform or when you approach a project, what are you trying to achieve? Or is that too? I think it is, um, it is a, uh, it's a concept of what you do on stage. What are we doing when we go on stage and perform? Um, for me, it is a moment of a communication of deep understanding of the music and that bringing that alive to the audience. And um, if you think about the, you know, the most smallest nuances that maybe at this moment, you know, my breath was a little bit deeper and I might need a little longer time for this note. How will that, that influence the rest of the piece? And um, I feel a little bit more uh, yearning in Xandi's dissonance here and uh, all we feel in the moment like oh come on let's go for it and let's show this character even more and we you know we, we play so we played in these Haydn uh, six quartets by uh, Opus, 20, Opus 20 by Haydn um, and uh, I cannot play the piece the same all the time to be honest I can't also I cannot reproduce something that I plan what I can plan is I know how to play it I need to know technically how to do it, but in the moment, I, if I have the room, I will just do what at the moment is I find appropriate. And I used to be a little bit too much of limit, in the sense that sometimes I was would be kind of too wild and uh, not to be caught. Um, so you need to find um, uh, that as an ind individual player. But also the quartet, um, each each concert is different depending on the audience, on the light, on what you had to eat, on your mood, uh, and uh, everything. And so, um, and we want to experience something. We don't want to put a product on the table, but we want to live the music in the moment. And the better we know, and the more we have rehearsed, and the more we know the nuances that we think that they are in the music, that doesn't mean we do them the same all the time, but we know what's in there. And this time it might be a little bit longer. And then maybe Xandi feels like, you know, going totally crazy at Schulhof. And it's like, you know, brace yourself <laughs> and, uh, and just go along with it. Because there's just this uh, modus. Or there's a, there's a Alad Zingarese a trio in, in one of the Haydn things. And you can play it either, either stylized or you can play it really like, uh, like Zingarese. You can choose. And you know sometimes how you get out of the f of, of the menuet determines how the trio would be. That was one of our last uh, rehearsal things. You know, the, depending on how get uh, how I get into the menuet, that will in, in affect the trio. And then coming back, that you know. So yeah, Sorry. there is. I mean, I don't know how how much improv theater. Uh, you know, I mean, there's that wonderful um, TV show called Whose Line Whose Is line It Anyway? Is anyway. Oh, yeah. Which maybe is too old for some of you, but it, it's, a lot of it is on, on YouTube and it's, it's really magnificent. And there, one of the basic tenets, I mean, in all of improv theater, is you just go with what it is. And then you sort of take it and you, you make it your own and then you work with it and then the other person will go with what, what it is. But, but Yes and, yes. yes and, and then you take it and then see what happens. But but it is that sort of not blocking um, somebody else's idea Can in that I just moment. Put one more thought. So our education is very much that we need to 
we have auditions, we have exams, we have all these situations where we need to produce something to please somebody and to let us, you know, pass some kind of limitation. And um, so it's very often it's about the product being good enough. Um, and I think this is an option, but um, I hate exams and I hate mm -hmm. being I hate being tested and all and being judged. Um, so. Um, and I think that makes us square sometimes. So, of course, we have to deliver, we have to play in tune and all that. Um, but it's about being creative and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a life thing. Okay, so maybe we'll wrap up with one final thing. Uh, we've gotten some tremendous insights from you today and I'd like to thank you very much for that. But uh, on a final note, uh, pardon the pun, um, <laughs> One, one piece of advice that you would give a musician at, at our age, uh, leaving college now uh, and entering their musical career, looking back, one piece of advice that you might give us? Don't be pedantic, <laughs> <laughs> is one piece of advice. Um, be, be open to as much as you can and suck up as many influences you can and be true to what you are searching for in your own artistic utterances. Yeah, and really like, like yourself. Yeah. I would say yeah. for me the yeah. most important thing is that no matter where you are, it's always good enough because this is who you are. I find that one of the most meaningful things I, when I see people, um, if, you are, if you think you're not good enough, you know, f people expect something for you and you're not up to it. Um, might be somebody expects something of, of you and you are not up to it at that situation, but that doesn't do anything to who you are, that doesn't make you less worth, uh, worthy. So we define a lot about our s professional success and it's very difficult to get out of this situation. It's the same still for me. Of course I'm happy when I play a concert and everybody is yeah, great. Then the next day you feel like really good. On the other hand, when the pandemic hit and I didn't play, after a while I didn't miss it at all and I didn't want to play actually. I thought, oh, it's fine. Life is really good. Um, uh, so just be, um, be, be kind to yourself and embrace the things you cannot do. The things you cannot do, ask somebody else to do them or ask, ask for advice and just love yourself. I think that's yeah. most important. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank Bravo. you. It was a wonderful week. Wonderful uh, no, week. it was two days, but I was here for <laughs> such a long time. Sorry, I have been here longer, so I feel like... Yeah. <laughs> Well, and bravo to you. Yeah, thank Truly you. Truly well been yeah. invaluable, I'm sure, to everyone. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. We look forward to the next time.